with one. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, whenever we make uh, fall pressure, we're supposed to have a pump that's positive displacement. But in order for a positive displacement pump to produce fall pressure in an engine or a transmission, there has to be a pressure relief valve. We talked about that a little bit before. And it's got to squeeze the spring to the point where it opens a hole and that, that, that'll bleed off. And the spring has got to be strong enough so that it's got to put, you know, however many pounds of pressure the relief valve is done. Now this is a gyrotor type pump. This is like an automatic transmission. Engine oil pumps have this kind of thing. If they're a pump like that. And basically it's set whether that outer part of that and the inner part of it uh, is going to open up on one side and it squeezes out on the other side. That's just one type of pump that we have. It's a fairly common kind, but there's other types too. Now, this right here is a crescent type pump. The reason I call it a crescent type and pump the crescent. is because it's got that little crescent there. And so this is turning through, you know, you got a bigger, and you can see how as this thing turns, and this gets bigger, it's going to draw oil in from one side, and as it turns over here and it gets small again, it's going to squish it out the other side. This is basically the way that works. Now, it's a positive displacement pump. Now, what does that mean, positive displacement? means if it moves, there's going to be oil moving. Uh, what's another positive displacement pump that you use on a jack, maybe? Water pump? Yeah. Nope. Water pump is not positive displacement. You can actually, because it doesn't have, it's got little, a little, uh, impeller that's running next to a reaction surface, but it can cavitate if it's, you know, in other words, it can actually spin and not put water anywhere if, you, if things are stopped up. On this one here, if you stop it up, it's going to stop. I mean, it's basically going to lock the pump down. Uh, I put a, uh, did a engine job on a forklift back when I was working down in Texas in the late, in the 70s, and I had a, uh, uh, when I put it all back together, uh, it was hunkering down trying to quit and because there was a little orifice in this big hydraulic line and uh, whenever we had pushed the forklift out of there a little tiny piece of pea gravel got up in that line and it stopped up that little orifice and that hydraulic pump was trying to pump against that piece of pea gravel to push through that little orifice and all that. So long and short of it is in the hydraulic, it was a positive type of pump, you know. Uh, now this is a variable displacement vane pump in a front wheel drive automatic transaxle. Variable displacement means because this will move back and forth as necessary to change the capacity of the pump. And these vanes basically, you know, they're, they go in and out. And so you see vane, uh, the little vane air motors and stuff in your, uh, like in your impact races and that kind of thing. Um, that's what, you know, vane pumps are ever, this is a power steering pump. And these vanes basically, you know, you can see how they'll, uh, you know, they pull air, pull all down on one side, squish it out on the other. It's pretty much the way all them work. Um, I had, when I was working on those forklifts down there, uh, I got used to the, the, to the standard little block pump that they put on all those things. And um, on the side of it, there was a funky little um, symbol that, like, the pump was put together, but the, the part that had the veins in it was in the middle. And, uh, and I just, you know, got to where I was really, really familiar with those things because I was, I was having to take them apart and work on them. And then I came to work, and I worked at a truck shop for a while. And uh, out there at uh, the military base, they had bought this um, doggone uh, bucket truck, brand new bucket truck, painted bright yellow. It wouldn't work. The hydraulics wouldn't work on it. I mean, they couldn't get the bucket to raise up, so they brought it to up there where we were. And the guy told me I hadn't been working there that long, and he says, go see if you can figure out why those hydraulics won't work on that bucket truck. Well, they had a little power takeoff on the side of the transmission that had the hydraulic pump on it, right? I mean, it was driving the hydraulic pump. And uh, I got up there and I, I laid under there on the creeper and I looked at it and as soon as I looked at it, I said, uh, that pump's not put together right. And he said, what do you mean it's not put together right? I said, the middle of it is, it put, is flipped around backwards. When they put it together, they put it together wrong. And I could tell the little symbol on the side of the little part where the veins are, you know, the little weaver part. Of it. So I pulled the bolts out and flipped that thing around, put it back together and we had a bucket. You know, really terrific. But the simple fact was, prior experience, was if I had not worked on those forklifts and had dealt with all those hydraulic pumps, there's no way on earth I'd have figured that out. I'd have probably just replaced the pump, you know, but I knew how to fix it because, you know, your experience is going to take you places. Now, the main air flow mo uh, motor in the impact range drives this motor in power in the impact range. The little, see the little vanes right here. That's your main air motor. And uh, you basically run air through there, and this thing whirls and spins, and it goes, I got some planetary gears, and then most of these, and all that kind of thing. And there's the part that goes bam, 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 and heats on the, you know, 
socket and turns things. Now the pump and the necessity of pressure regulator, see basically here's your uh, your pump right here. It's going to be shoving this in there. You can see uh, your valve, there's a balance there going on. Now you might notice in a lot of these automatic transmissions you'll, you'll see these valves uh, set where they'll have a bigger lands and on some part of the valve than they do others so that the pressure can overcome the lesser pressure. Then here's your spring and all that. And so you know, there's your little uh, valve out of balance and your valve imbalance. And so whatever thing, see when these line up so the fluid can flow, you can kind of see how that works. Any positive displacement pump's got a relief valve to regulate the pressure. If that spring breaks or if it sticks, you know, so that this is always in a position where it's letting the pressure go away, uh, you burn engines up and stuff like that and you lose your pressure. Any automatic transmission that doesn't have pump pressure ain't going to move. It's got to have pump pressure to move. All right, engine oil pump relief valve. There's your little gyrotor pump in there. Well, uh, it's an engine oil pump. And there's not, there's, a, there's some uh, Asian cars, some American cars, there's other cars that have this uh, relief valve in here. And it, basically that relief valve uh, is where you need to be looking if you've got one that lost oil pressure and burned up. Don't, don't neglect that because, you know, this, you might notice this actually is the oil pump itself. And pay attention to that relief valve. You can actually take that relief valve out of there and make sure that it operates freely and the spring's not broke and all that. And it's part of the pump cover. Um, now this is a conventional transmission pump pressure regulator. You got a large race of boost assembly spring. There's the spring and all that in the pump cover. Uh, one time when I was working at the Ford place, and I don't know why, how this, exactly how this Cadillac wound up over there, was a 81 diesel Eldorado. This guy ran over a muffler that was laying in the road. He busted the transmission housing. And so what I had to do was pull the uh, transmission out of that doggone thing, get a brand new transmission housing, put all of the guts out of the other transmission, and this one was an insurance job. And whenever I got done with it, um, I realized about the time I put it in gear and it didn't pull, I said, I didn't put the pressure relief valve in there. You know, so I had to pull the pan back off and, you know, take a snap ring out, put the pressure relief valve in there with its spring, and then I had pump pressure. It was kind of scary for a minute there. But it was a, it was a valve similar to this, but it was in the bottom of the transmission. Now, uh, this right here, this pump is driven by the rotating power of the engine. Uh, basically, the torque converter bolted to the flywheel and the, the pump splines on the back of the flywheel. And the pump, to see that this, you might not realize it, but whenever you've got your, uh, that filter, you know when you have to pull that filter out of the pan? That's actually going right up into the pump on a lot of these. I mean, it's going into the pump. So if you're ever tearing an automatic transmission down and you've still got the pan and the filter on it, which is, no, you're not ever supposed to do that, but if I've got a rookie tearing down an automatic transmission that's never torn one down before, the first thing they want to do is go in there and start trying to take the pump out. Well, you can't take the pump out when that filter's up in there. So you're supposed to actually lay it over there, you know, turn it over if it's on a stand or, or roll it over if it's on a table, take the pan off and take the valve body off, which is going to take the pump. Then you can, you know, start taking the rest of it up. But the first thing you're supposed to take off is a control in the valve body assembly. And the torque converter is holding the flex plate, and usually there are slots or flats on the plate where it goes in the transmission. That drives the pump. And you can see how the fluid goes, you know. And once again, all the heat in an automatic transmission is just about all of it's created, created in the torque converter. And that's why whenever it leaves the torque converter, it goes to the cooler and then it comes back and goes back in the pan and starts over again. All the mechanical components need fluid for actuation or lubrication. On well, some of these uh, transmission uh, overhaul kits, they'll actually have a little uh, uh, sheet that'll show you the, the separator plate. And they'll say, if you go into the separator plate, like on some of these RE401 Nissans, and say, go to this particular hole and drill it out to this size, because that way it'll provide more lubricating pressure I mean, lubricating and uh, lubrication to the uh, planetary gear set. Because they, you know, they know they're, they're bad to wear out, you know, the planetary up there. You know, but, all right. And so this is an off axis pump. It's located out of the center line. See this right here? You got a chain driving that pump. Instead of being right behind the torque converter, it's down here on this particular one here. And that's the ADL90. Uh, it's a good thing with the, the pump is part of the valve body on that one, which is really unusual. And here's the 8L90 solenoids. Uh, see all the solenoids in there? Uh, now, there's going to be a pop test on those tomorrow, so y'all remember that and you have to know what they all do. All right, so this off axis set up. The pump is chain driven instead of behind the, uh, and in line with the curve, and it's more easily removed. You can change the pump out fairly easy on that one without having to you know, tear everything else down. Uh, the off axis pump, chain driven by the torque converter, like that right there, there's a rocket right there that drives it. 
and that little, that's a laminated chain. They make all laminated chains, they, they have a tendency to stretch like old timing chains, but they are quieter uh, than other types of chains usually. And when the valve body is lifted off the transmission, a pump can be unbolted or removed from the housing. That's what it looks like right there. And let's take the pump apart. All right, so you're going to take this little uh, retaining ring off, allow the pressure plate to slide off the pump shaft, and you get, the little, get you a little magnet uh, after you pull these pins out, and you can pull these, uh, these little... Uh, did you have a pocket screwdriver with a magnet on the back of it? Have you used that magnet? Are you glad you got that? Would you rather have one with the with the uh, valve core on it? You can't have you can't have one. Right, so using a magnet, each of the pump veins can be removed, and then this is see this is what I was talking about. If you put this together backwards, that pump ain't gonna work right. So you got to pay attention to how you're taking it apart. Oh, and you know this is what I was talking about down here. Now, when the second retaining ring is removed, you basically can pull that little main assembly off there. The pump and drive gear rotor can be separated from the pump cover. And then the pump drive shaft locks the drone sprocket by slide tension clip. And that's a little um, locate the clips tab. And see that? You know, whenever you slide that over, it lets it drop out of there. You slide it back to lock it in place. See, that's not too complicated. Uh, that unlocks the drive shaft from the driven gear. And here it is all cleaned up. That's a neat little rig right there. Now there's some heavy duty machine work that goes into this and these parts are not cheap if you ever have to wind up buying any of them. Uh, now this binary displacement main pumps two discharge ports, what are referred to as line and secondary line. And you can kind of see this, there's your pressure regulator valve on this one here. And there's your line pressure blow off, you know, in case you got a kind of something that stops up, you know, and all. Um, back, one of the things that doesn't hardly ever happen, but it can happen, if the pressure relief valve sticks closed where it can't open, on a lot of these new cars, it'll blow the oil filter off the car. So if you see one that has blown the oil filter off, and then you screw another oil filter on there and it blows that one off, you pretty well have a stuck pressure relief valve. <laughs> That's usually what that is. Uh, back in the, you know what kind of oil filter they put on cars back in the 40s and early 50s? They had a steel, a real heavy steel cup. It had a bolt going up through the middle of it, and they had a canister top filter that went inside of it. And uh, Cliff Akridge was a guy that I used to know that was a, you know, he was a machinist and he had worked at the Cadillac dealership in 1949. And he said there was this Cadillac that was losing power on Hill, belonged to a doctor. And um, he said uh, uh, that they've worked and worked, worked on trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And uh, he said, I went over and sat down in the seat and I gave it some gas and I saw the oil pressure gauge peg out. And I told the guy, the other shop foreman at the Cadillac place, he said, if you'll put an oil pump on this, it'll fix it. And the guy says, no, it ain't going to fix that oil pump. I'm going to fix this because he was thinking it was something power related. And so they put an oil pump on it and took care of the problem. I think he won a $100 bet on that deal. <laughs> but I mean, when he saw the oil pressure peg out, he instantly knew what it was. You see, because of the relief valve and stuff. Anyway, uh, both of them are routed to their dedicated locations. You can see that on the way to the pressure regulator valve. They connect together through a shuttle wall. Now, line pressure on automatic transmission is basically an intricate system of hydraulic. Hydraulic pressure moves these spool valves. Uh, to redirect fluid from one place to another. And some of the fluid is used for lubrication and it's constantly feeding some part of the planetary gear. So line pressure idling is going to research, it's going to circulate, keep everything lubricated and air free. Bubbles are not good whenever you got oil. If you put too much transmission fluid or too much uh, engine oil in a vehicle, it can make it whip it up into a foam and then it'll lubricate with a flip, right? Now some people claim that uh, the, these ships that disappear in the Bermuda Triangle, you know about those? There's a lot of methane gas coming up out of the floor, and it's just like foam. And so when the ship sails onto that foam, it just goes down. You know, because that foam can't, can't support the ship like water. See what I'm saying? It's foamy water. And, a lot, and of course, that won't explain why planes disappear out there. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. I forgot why the planes disappear. Yeah. No. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll make a phone call and come back with an answer on that after lunch. Okay. okay. <laughs> Now, cruising down the road, the line pressure is moderate since the transmission's only job is to hold the clutches that are already applied when you're maintaining an even highway speed. Uh, that's not very hard on anything. Maintaining an even highway speed, if you get a lot of highway miles on a vehicle, you go a long way without having any trouble because you're not having to build momentum and all that kind of thing. Line pressure goes high during acceleration. The harder the acceleration, the higher the pressure. Now, when you've got, uh, you know, you've got governor pressure, and you know, and, and they basically they the governor pushes back and forth like this. So as the pressure, uh, you know, as the governor pressure comes up, it wants to shift, right? 
Well, throttle valve pressure, which is whenever you're going into that or if you've got a modulator valve, it's going to push back against governor pressure to make it shift later. Because when you're, when you're getting on it going uphill, you want it to hold the gears longer, don't you? So as that pressure goes up, it'll hold the gears longer before it'll be able to move these things around. And that's what we're doing on that. Uh, when shifts are happening and the, pre if the pressure is low, the clutches will suffer if the pressure is too low. If you forget to hook up that throttle valve linkage or that cable, when you, I mean, you can make everything else right and forget to hook that cable up and burn the transmission up. Well, burn mine up. Yep. But, uh, well, they, it'll, it'll, well, yours has got a modulator valve on it, is what it is, on that one. And if somebody mean, takes the vacuum line off the modular, modular valve, it shifts late and hard, which doesn't really hurt the transmission a whole lot. It ain't gonna hurt my, it ain't gonna shift my well, you got, a, you got a stick. I forgot about that. Okay. I got a stick. Um, but, uh, well, no, your you're, you're, you're heavy foot's the worst but to take that thing is. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> once the shift is complete, the transmission goes back to the lower line of pressure required to maintain feet. Now, a lot of these vehicles will actually, uh, they've got this fuzzy sort of a logic on them where they know when the transmission is about to shift and they'll detorque the engine right at the shift point and make it where you can't even feel the shift. Okay. So the governor, this is what the governor looks like. You know, a funny story, uh, I got this Ford Escort one time that I was working on back in 1984 when I was at the Lincoln Mercury dealership. And uh, it came in, they said it wouldn't shift. It just stayed in low gear, an automatic. And uh, so I drove it and I said, well, that's got to have something to do with the governor. And so uh, the governor on that one is kind of like an old 350 turbo hydromatic. You just pop a little clip off and pull the cover off and then pull the governor out. You know, it looked like that. In case that the gear was longer and skinny on that escort. But it looked just like that. Now what happens are those weights swing out and they move a valve inside there and that's how the governor pressure increases. But anyway, on this one here, I pull the governor out and said, I don't see anything wrong with that one. I'm just going to throw another one in there. So I threw another one in there and it shifted. I said, well, I pat myself on the back. I took care of that problem. And about a week later, the back just like it was, just like it was. And so what I found out was that little gear on the final drive that's supposed to spin that governor had was it was loose in there, was wallowing around, and it had worn the plastic teeth off the dadgum governor. And I had to basically pull the bottom part of the pan off and pull that final drive out, the differential part of it, and re replace that plastic gear, that, the drive gear for the governor and all that. That was a that was a paid six hours. <clears throat> but anyway, centrifugal force moves the spool valve against the spring and redirects pressure and triggers the next shift. Now most of them, except for Chrysler, use vacuum modulator valves. Now on your vacuum modulator valves, these will be color coded, and in there behind them, they got these little pins. A lot of these people. Uh, the one that we got here that I always point to, that's got a uh, that Pontiac and that Oldsmobile have both got a modulator valve on them. It's got a vacuum line going to it. If you pull the vacuum line off, like I said, it'll shift late and hard. Uh, so governor pressure and modulator pressure, you know, is pushing against each other all the time. Uh, basically, governor pressure will overcome modulator pressure. And, uh, and I tell you something else, the modulator valve sometimes if it's not if it's not quite working right, it'll make it, you know, make a double shift and make it feel funny. Uh, over time the modulator valve was replaced by throttle valve. Chrysler was doing this in the 1960s. They never had a modulator valve on anything they had. They always had throttle valve linkage. Uh, and everybody else was. But what will happen on that one, you see that spring right there? It's supposed to hold that uh, that uh, slotted uh, Little yeah. valve linkage thing forward. If somebody leave that spring unhooked and that thing's laying back, it'll go boom. It'll shift real hard, which really hasn't hurt anything. It's not like gonna tear something up. But if it's shifting too soft, it's just gonna burn out clutches. So how do we check line pressure? Now on an older vehicle, we do it this way: look up the location of the pressure port, connect the gauge, lock the brakes, record the readings at idle and wide open throttle in every gear except park neutral. Now it goes based on your readings. You can basically find internal transmission leaks that way. You can also find out if the torque converter stator is bad because if you got low stall speed, if the engine is not underpowered for some reason, if you got low stall speed, that means your torque converter stator, you know, one-way clutch is bad in there because that multiplies your torque. All right, there's a GM line presser testing with a gauge and a scan tool. Let's see if I can make that video play. It may not play. It's not. Huh? It's not going to play. It's not going to play. Gone. What happened to you? Look at that. It tries to play, but it won't play. I'm not going to agonize over that too much. One way or another, one on this one you do, you get your gauge you put on there, you get your scan tool, and you increase the amperage to your electronic pressure control solo and watch your pressure and see if it goes up. That's nothing really too bad. All right, now this one right here, let me see this. See if you see something wrong with this. 
Look at these numbers. The governor pressure on 100. That's fine. Target governor pressure is 127. That means that's what it wants it to be. What is it actually? Uh, it's in one. Is that a problem you think? Yeah. If you're if you've ever seen on your scan tool, if it's looking if it's got a target that it's not reaching, that's the first place you're going to start. Okay. That's it. Sierra's going to sleep over there. All right, let's see. Uh, and we wound up with, uh, well, I got to tell another story on that one. You can see that changing as we go. And uh, I'm going to move forward to the next slide so we can get past this. All right. Now, this was, <clears throat> what's wrong with this picture? Vehicles idling, transmission wouldn't shift down sometimes. This lady thought she had a problem with her brakes. Look at it. The throttle position sensor volts is higher than a minimum TPS, and we've let the gas, we've let off the gas all the way. But that was still high. That confused the engine controller or the powertrain control module, and it was whole keeping it. It wouldn't drop it into out of the higher gear. You know, it was keeping it up like it thought you. It didn't know you were coasting. Is what it amounted to. And so it didn't know what to do with the transmission. And uh, that turned out to be a thing. What you got to do though, whenever you analyze. The way that you're, you know, whenever you're looking at those scan tool readings, you need to be sharp enough to where you can tell what it is that you're looking at and know what to do about it, basically. And don't be, uh, I've seen people looking at scan tool readings. <clears throat> the smartest thing you can do, and listen to this, whenever it's talking about scan tool, is plug into as many good cars as you can. So you'll know what, whenever one looks bad. When we first got the service bay diagnostic system, uh, we were getting these graphs that we were pulling up to look at things. And one day this guy uh, came to me that was working on this automatic transmission. And he says, this thing is just doesn't feel right when it shifts. And I can't tell you exactly what's going on with it. And so uh, I went and made a recording and pulled it up. And uh, I looked at it and I said, well, I can see where the shifts are. Because every time the RPM drops, every time it shifts into the next gear, you know. But I really didn't know what I was looking at. I knew, I knew there was something going on. But as far as putting my finger on it, I didn't see any smoking gun. So... I got another car that was just like it, which you can do that at the dealership, you know, because they've got a lot of cars just alike. And I drove that car and made recordings under the same conditions, and the recordings looked totally different, and that way I understood what was going on. You know, his actually was dropping into the gear too sharply. Instead of shifting smoothly, it was, you know, shifting harshly, and he was having terrible trouble figuring it out. Anyway, I don't remember what happened on that one, but that looking at a known good recording is like a, like a scope pattern on cam and crank sensors. You know, some of y'all are going to be doing some of that next semester. Cam and crank sensor scope patterns. If you're looking at a cam and crank sensor scope pattern, you may say, oh, well, I see a pattern, but I don't know what it means. If you don't have something to compare it to, so when you get your scope, you start building a waveform library, okay? So every time you get a chance to look at one that doesn't happen to be given problems, build yourself a waveform. This is what it looks like on such and such a vehicle. Save that. Take a picture and then you can pull your waveform library up, you'd be surprised how that'll save you trouble later. You know, when you're trying to look troubleshoot one that you're looking at it and say, well, I see a, a pattern here, but I don't know if it's correct or not, you know. Uh, but anyway, okay, so did everybody go to sleep in here while I was in it? Nope. I'm just freezing. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. All right, well, at least we got some coffee now. Uh, so thanks to Jennifer. She went and got us some coffee and hot chocolate and all kinds of stuff. Yes. Yes. Jennifer, right, save the day. All right.